morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining class this morning. Uh, we're almost uh, to the end of our uh, uh, lessons. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, Christ's substitutionary uh, suffering. Uh, Christ died in our place. Uh, he took upon himself uh, the penalty for our sins. He took upon himself our suffering and our pain. And we discussed uh, Christ's substitutionary suffering, uh, that he did it for us. Um, that he did it, uh, the main reason why he did it for us is out of love, okay? Um, and we see, we noted the statements in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, where Christ died for us, he laid down his life for us, and one died for all, and he died for all. So we looked at that, and then we uh, looked at Christ uh, was raised, uh, so that we could be justified, uh, so that we can be acquitted of our sins, um, uh, that you know we could have could be seen by the Father, uh, just as if we have never sinned. Okay, so Romans chapter four verse twenty five talks about that Christ was delivered up for our offenses, and He was raised because of our justification. And then we saw that uh, Christ bore his sins, uh, our sins in his body. He became a uh, sin for us. He who knew no sin uh, became sin for us so that we can become uh, the righteousness of God. And then he took upon himself our infirmities. He bore our sicknesses. So we looked at uh, all of the results of Christ's substitutionary suffering on the cross, uh, what happened as a result of him dying in our place, taking our sins, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking the penalty of our sins, which is death. We see that uh, he bore our infirmities, he bore our sicknesses, not only took upon himself our sins so that we could be redeemed, so that we can be justified, but he also bore our sicknesses and our infirmities. Um, and uh, by making that substitutionary suffering on the cross, we see that he became a curse for us, okay, and um, that he tasted death for everyone uh, as a result that we could taste life, eternal life. Uh, eternal life is not something that is something in the way in the future, which we uh, use the term eschatology, but it is something that uh, we can experience here and now. It is a realized eschatology, something that we can um, experience, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we can experience the fullness or the benefits or uh, the gifts of eternal life, of us receiving salvation in Christ, of our sins being forgiven, of us being uh, redeemed from the law of sin, from the bondage of sin, uh, from us being set free from being slaves of sin and Satan, uh, and set free from every bondage and stronghold and, um, uh, you know, uh, being slaves of Satan. And we are uh, here to enjoy uh, every blessing uh, that Christ has purchased for us on the cross, that he tasted that for all of us, um, that we might, uh, you know, receive uh, the Zoe life, the life that God has in himself, um, uh, the God kind of life, the full, sufficient, perfect life uh, that Christ has and that he wants us to enjoy. So we looked at uh, Christ's uh, substitutionary suffering and we looked at all of the benefits uh, that we um, receive as a result of what Christ did on the cross, okay? Uh, so we will look at chapter 11 today, his resurrection and his uh, exaltation. And before we look at this chapter, can uh, one of us lead us in prayer, please? Yes, go ahead, Siddhikenu. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, for everything you have done for us, Lord. You are, happy. You are the reason for our happiness. Lord, the beautiful day you have given us, Lord. Many are not here to witness this day, Lord. But you have made us alive. You have given us the oxygen, Lord. With you, you are giving us free, of course. Lord, thank you for everything you have done, Lord. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance to understand 
each and every word spoken by the teacher lord the lord protect us and provide us in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you uh, so do you have any questions uh, any doubts i hope you take it some time to read through your notes uh, so any of you have any questions on chapter 10 christ substitutionary suffering any doubts any questions anything you all would like to add into what was already said or thought or what's in your notes no one i hope you've taken some time to go through the notes so maybe if you could just want to uh, you know just go through your notes and see if you have any questions any doubts so basically uh, thus far in the course on christology um, you know we are trying to understand uh, you know um, uh, christ uh, the doctrine of christ and so we said at the beginning that uh, in christology a christology a student of christology who studies this topic or this doctrine is looking for answers to basically these questions has god indeed ma- become man has the uh, you know how could the logos truly become flesh and how could uh, humanity and deity exist in real unity and in oneness in one person that is christ and so in christology we are basically studying uh, you know the pre-existence of christ his eternal nature uh, of christ that he is uh, he is god even before uh the beginning even before a creation that he is god he uh is in uh the bosom of the father that means very intimate with the father uh, and one with the father and the holy spirit uh we we'll also looked at the old testament prophecies regarding christ with his humanity we looked at his uh, incarnation we looked at his uh, uh sinlessness and uh, his substitutionary suffering on the cross him being uh you know the the lamb of god and now we're coming to uh you know the part where we're going to look at his uh, uh resurrection and his uh ascension okay so when we think about christ's resurrection what thoughts come to your mind nothing power uh you said power rosely yes okay uh why did you mention the word power power of resurrection okay the power of resurrection so what is your understanding about the power of resurrection in what manner jesus would have uh, god would have resurrected jesus okay in what manner god would have resurrected jesus okay okay that's a good uh, thought so that it will help me to uh, uh, to also share because sometimes when when we are teaching the class we assume that students know you know all of these things and so we kind of uh, uh, think it's irrelevant to mention it but uh, just to get 
your, your thoughts and inputs uh, will just help in uh, help me to know you know the areas that I need to uh, you know share on or throw more light on. Okay, thank you, Rosalind. Yes, Lubega. I think without resurrection, without us, the Christians, because when Jesus Christ was uh, crucified, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the 11 apostles went into hiding, not until Maria Magdalene came and told them that Christ is alive. This is when they got the bold, the boldness of looking for him. So I think in a nutshell, without the resurrection, without the Christian church. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, you said without the resurrection, the last sentence? Without the resurrection, without the Christian church. So it is in the power of the resurrection that we are believing in Christ and hoping that we shall also have a resurrection in and in that life after. Yes, good. Thank you. So if there was, if Christ never resurrected, then, you know, we would be left without any hope that Christ resurrected. Uh, gives us hope, uh, gives us eternal hope, eternal life, uh, because he's the first fruits of those who've risen, uh, and we are uh, to follow in that. Um, and also, yes, it's the hope of the church, and uh, if Christ uh, had not resurrected, there would be no hope, there would be no church, our faith would be just futile, as uh, Paul writes in his letters. Yes. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else can share all your thoughts or what you think about resurrection? Hello. Hi, Paul. Yes, Pastor. Me, I think about to uh, the Holy Spirit because when the Bible says when when Jesus died, He left the Holy Spirit as our comforter and our helper. So. I want to understand more that process that transact trans nini, trans nini from from the power of Jesus Christ then to the Holy Spirit which we now we are now using. I want to understand that process. Okay, thank thank, uh, thank you, Paul. So I'll look into that angle as well. That after Christ uh, uh, resurrected from the dead and he ascended back to the Father. Uh, you know, he asked his disciples to wait in Jerusalem uh, till they are clothed or endued with power. Um, and uh, they received the promise of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus also says that you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power uh, and you will be my witnesses. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will my, be my witnesses in uh, Jerusalem, in Samaria, and Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, so that is Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but we will look into that as well. Okay, anyone else? Ma'am, also, uh, it reminds me of Romans eight eleven, mm -hmm. It says, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Yes, thank you, Rosalind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rosalind. That's a very powerful verse. The spirit of him who raised Jesus back from dead to life, the same spirit lives in you, then the, the same spirit will give life to your mortal bodies. That's something that is a it's a powerful reminder of, uh, of uh, you know, what Christ has accomplished on the cross uh, at, and also the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us, indwelling in us, uh, and also that, uh, you know, God gives us, uh, gives, will give us life in our mortal bodies. And it's a promise and it's a very powerful truth and a very powerful verse that we can speak and declare over our lives. Um, I remember, uh, I think uh, last year when the pandemic, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, it's at the peak in April or sometime in March, one of our church members was, uh, uh, was with, uh, diagnosed with COVID and was in a really bad state and he was in hospital and, um, you know, uh, his situation was getting worse and the doctors were... Uh, you know, did everything and they were just discussing that, you know, they'll have to shift him to 
um, to Velo where they have uh, better facilities, medical facilities and all of that because uh, they did what they could best uh, for him. And uh, so the, the person realized that his situation uh, is getting worse. And that's when he received a, a, a WhatsApp message from uh, Pastor Ashish and uh, Pastor had sent him this promise from Romans 8.11. This person says it's the first time he had really read that verse, you know, the spirit of him who raised Jesus back from death to life, the same spirit dwells in you. The spirit will give life to your mortal bodies. And it came so power, this truth came so powerfully to him. It was like a rhema word that just hit him. Uh, so powerfully and uh, he just believed that word and he said the moment he believed he felt uh, you know a, a shift a change something just happened drastically and after that his um, you know his levels were getting uh, stable he was getting stable there was good improvement and um, he uh, sorry he walked out of the hospital uh, you know healed uh, so he says it was that verse. So that verse is really powerful. Thank you for sharing, Rosalind, from uh, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 11. Good to memorize that verse also. Uh, th so thank you for sharing that. Uh, anyone else would like to share your thoughts on resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or the events that happened after his resurrection, the events that uh, took place before his uh, ascension, No? Okay. Thank you all for, for those of you who shared. We look at uh, chapter 11, uh, Christ's resurrection and his uh, exaltation. Um, we know that, uh, you know, Christ's resurrection was foretold um, as we see in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 uh, to 32. In Acts chapter 2, we read about um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And um, uh, there was a sound of a mighty wind, a hurricane uh, wind, a powerful wind. And, um, and we see that uh, uh, the 120 of them who were in that room uh, were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, because of the sound of that mighty hurricane-like wind, people who had come from all over, uh, you know, uh, from all countries of the world, to Jerusalem to suffer, uh, to um, uh, celebrate the feast of the Passover. Uh, they heard the sound and they were attracted to the upper room and they saw um, all of these 120 in that upper room uh, speaking in various tongues, but it was not gibberish tongues. It was not something that they couldn't understand, but each one of them understood and they realized that these people, these men are Galileans, but they're speaking in languages of different um, other native countries that come from and they understood that they were all praising and worshiping God and someone some people said that you know the disciples were drunk and then Peter heard this and he took this opportunity and he preaches uh, to them and we know that uh, 3,000 of them accepted Christ and were baptized um, but in his uh, sermon, or when he was preaching to the people who had gathered there, uh, when he spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Apostle Peter points to the Old Testament uh, references uh, indicating the full fulfillment of Christ's resurrection. And we read this in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 32. So uh, can one of you read uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 32, please? And if someone else can open to Psalms chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. So one of you can read Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 32. And someone else can read Psalms chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 32, ma'am. Yes, Rosalind. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Amen. Thank you. So here, um, when Peter, Apostle Peter, is preaching his sermon, uh, and you know, uh, there's a lengthy sermon, but we're just looking at uh, verses 29 to verses 32, uh, and we see that uh, you know he's talking about uh, Christ's death and his resurrection, and he's talking about the fulfillment of the Old Testament uh, prophecies. And basically, uh, he's uh, quoting or he's making a reference uh, to Acts, so, sorry, Psalms chapter 16, uh, verses 9 to 11. So can somebody read that, please? Uh, uh, Psalms chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. Psalm 16, 9 to 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in shore, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasure forevermore. Thank you, Zilatoli. So uh, in, in action, Two verses, was um, uh, thirty-one. It says that uh, you know he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, and his soul was not left in hates. Um, and in some places, it uh, you know hates or uh, the other word is shul. If you can look at Psalm chapter sixteen, uh, was uh, was nine to eleven. We we read again. For you will not leave my soul in shul. Basically, it's talking here, shul means uh, uh, the grave, okay, or being dead. Uh, that's what it means. This word shul or hates means uh, uh, grave or um, being dead. So here the emphasis uh, in these, uh, what Paul is, co sorry, Peter is uh, quoting from Psalm chapter 16, verses 9 to 11. He's saying that uh, Christ's body rose from the grave unlike David's, uh, which remains in the grave and says it's there even today. Uh, his grave is dead even here today. But Christ uh, rose from the dead, unlike David, whose grave is still there. It still remains even today. So the reasoning here is that, uh, you know, in verse 26, that says, my body also will live in hope uh, because you will not abandon me uh, to the grave. So Peter is basically using uh, David's psalm uh, to show us that Christ's body did not decay. Uh, he is therefore unlike David who died and was buried and his tomb is here even today as we read in verse uh, 29. So this is uh, 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 Peter affirming that yes, Christ died on the cross, uh, but he is not, uh, his body is not left to decay in the grave, but he has risen. And, uh, you know, they test, they are witnesses to the fact and they testify to the fact that they have seen uh, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So that is um, uh, his resurrection foretold. We look at Jesus himself foretelling his resurrection in many ways. So there are uh, a lot of uh, uh, scripture verses quoted for us, and we like to read them. So if um, different people can read the scripture passages would be good. Uh, Matthew, I'll just uh, read it out so you all can uh, open it out to the scripture passages and we just take a look at it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 to 23. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, 30 to 32, and John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. Okay, I'll just repeat that again. Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 17, 22 to 23, Matthew 26, 30 to 32, 
John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, Luke 24, verses 1 to 8. Yeah, that's the end. Again, yeah. Go ahead, Rosalind. Yeah. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Amen. Thank you. So uh, we see that Jesus, um, you know, tells his disciples uh, or he begins to show them that uh, he is going to go to Jerusalem where he's going to suffer a great deal uh, the hands of um, the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and he will be killed but he will be raised up on the third day. Okay, Matthew 17, 22 to 23. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Thank you. So here uh, Jesus tells uh, his disciples that he will be betrayed, he will be killed, but he will raise up on the third day. And they were exceedingly uh, sorrowful because, you know, they did not want uh, to lose their friend. And that's why Jesus says, you know, I will not leave you as orphans. Uh, in John chapter 14 or John chapter 16, he says, I will not leave you orphans but you will receive the promise of the father and uh, you know he's talking about the holy spirit who will come and indwell in them who will live with them forever and they will not be left as um, orphans okay um, and because they were uh, jesus knew that they were exceedingly sorrowful to know that he's going to be killed but he'll be raised up on the third day but he's not going to leave them as orphans. He's going to be with them. He gives them the promise of the Holy Spirit that we read in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. Okay. Uh, but he had to, even though they were, uh, you know, sorrowful or sad, um, he had to tell them this uh, truth. Okay. Uh, Matthew 26, 30 to 32. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Thank you, Shubhashish. So here we see again Jesus telling uh, his disciples, uh, uh, you know, what are the events that are going to take place? This is just before he's going to be betrayed. Um, and uh, he says, you know, uh, many of you will uh, betray me, will be, you know, you'll be caused to stumble uh, because of the events that are going to progress this night. Um, but he says, you know, I will be raised again and I will go before you to uh, Galilee. Okay. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. Can one of you read John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22? John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it in again three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Thank you. So here uh, we see that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus clears the temple uh, uh, because they had... Uh, uh, were selling animals uh, in the Gentile courts and they make it they made it like a business place, a marketplace, and also because they were selling uh, the animals that were used for the sacrifice in the temple on a higher price compared to the market rate. 
Uh, so on both of these counts, or both of these points, uh, Jesus was very angry with them. And we see that he clears the temple and, uh, you know, he uh, overturns the tables. He, he chases everyone from the Gentile court uh, where the Gentiles used to stand and worship God. And he says, stop turning my father's house into a market. And then the Jews ask him, you know, what? Uh, sign do you show us since you do these things and, and just would destroy this temple and raise it up in three days and he was basically talking about his uh, body which is the temple and um, you know uh, Paul also writes and says that our bodies are the temple of the living God where the most high God dwells in us uh, and um, we see that the disciples um, remember what Jesus has spoken in this instant after uh, you know, he uh, he was uh, raised again and they saw him. Uh, they believed in the scripture, believed in the, uh, the prophecies that foretold uh, death and his resurrection and the words that Jesus had uh, said. So it was uh, his resurrection, uh, his appearing again to his disciples were all a confirmation uh, to the disciples uh, and they believed in the scriptures and uh, every word that Jesus had uh, spoken or Jesus had said. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. Can one of you read that, please? Amen. I read in Jesus' name. Yeah, sure. Luke chapter Go ahead. 24, verse, Luke 24, verse 1. Very early on Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb crying, crying carrying the sacks they had prepared. They found the stone running away from this entrance to the tomb. Verse 3. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse, 20, verse 4. They stood there, pusing about, about this, when suddenly two men in the bright, shiny cloth stood by them. Verse 5. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground. As the men said to them, why are you looking among the dead? What are you looking among the dead? For one who is alive. Verse 6. He is not here. He has been risen. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. Verse 8. The Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and three days later raised to life. Verse 8. Then the women remember his wealth. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. Uh, so here we see the woman going very early uh, in the morning to the tomb, uh, the first day of the week. Uh, you know, and they brought spices with them, and they wanted to embalm the body of Jesus. But when they, the tomb was uh, empty, and um, and the angels there said, you know, why do you seek the living among the dead? Okay, so Jesus had already risen. He was, uh, he's no longer dead. His body is not uh, corrupted in the grave or a decayed in the grave as, uh, as we saw, uh, uh, you know, uh, Peter preaching to the crowd in Acts chapter uh, 2 where he talking about the fulfillment of prophecy in Psalms. And so, you know, um, uh, the, the angels tell these women that, you know, he's not here, he's risen and uh, reminds them about what Jesus has spoken to them, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Okay? And uh, it said that, you know, they remembered his words, which means that they were greatly encouraged uh, to know that what Jesus had spoken uh, has come about and that nobody had stolen his body, nobody taken away his body, nobody had uh, hid his body, but um, uh, it's the truth that, you know, just as he said that he would uh, rise again on the third day and he has uh, risen. So all the theories that prove that, you know, people stole Jesus' body, they took him, took it away so that they can prove uh, to the people, to the world, to the uh, scribes, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and the chief priests that he truly rose again. Uh, it's not the truth because uh, we see here mentioned that, uh, you know, the angels reminding the women, don't you remember what Jesus said? 
uh, and they remembered and they were greatly uh, encouraged. They were greatly excited. They were blessed or happy that, um, you know, that their master, that their savior and their Lord has truly risen from the dead. So these are uh, a few scripture passages where uh, Jesus foretells his own resurrection uh, and it happens in different ways. Okay. And after Jesus resurrected, he showed himself alive in uh, many different instances when he appeared to his disciples, when they were going on the road to Emmaus, when, uh, you know, he spoke to uh, Mary at the tomb. He also appeared to the disciples were in the, then the closed room and he told Thomas to, you know, uh, touch his hands and feet to believe that he is the risen Lord and Savior is not some ghost. So we see that even at the Sea of Tiberias, when uh, uh, the disciples had gone fishing, Jesus makes breakfast for them. He has, uh, he breaks bread, gives it to them and they realize that he is uh, this, uh, indeed Jesus. So he shows himself or appears himself uh, and shows himself on various occasions to uh, his disciples just before his ascension. So let's read uh, two scripture passages on this Acts chapter 1 verse 3 and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 to 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 to 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. For 40 days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that prove beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he walked with them about in the kingdom of God. Thank you. So for 40 days after Jesus um, uh, rose from the dead, uh, he appeared on various in, uh, uh, you know, instances and uh, he, he uh, revealed himself to uh, his disciples in those 40 days. Um, and, uh, you know, the disciples uh, realized that Jesus is alive because he presented himself alive uh, after his suffering. And, um, and they are, uh, you know, a testimony witnesses to this truth that has happened, uh, that they had seen the risen Christ Jesus uh, during those 40 days. And also we see that uh, Jesus not just comes to them and um, uh, just to reveal himself or show or uh, to confirm that he's risen, but also he talks about various aspects of the kingdom of God. And one of those is about uh, the promise of the, whole, the promise of the Father, the gift of the Father, uh, that is the coming of the Holy Spirit, when they will be baptized with power or endured or clothed uh, with power from on high. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. Can one of you read that, please? First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1. Now, brothers, I want you, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken our, your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according <coughs> to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, thought some of some of have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then, all, and to, then to all apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, also to one abnormally born. For I am, ma'am, till eight. Yes, till eight. Ma'am, I am done. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here we see that Paul uh, laying down uh, the foundations of our faith. Uh, he's basically, uh, you know, explaining or laying down the foundations of our faith. He's writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying that, um, you know, Christ died for our sins. Uh, he was buried. He rose again on the third day and he said, all this is according to the scriptures. So he's laying the foundations for the faith and he's saying that uh, this is not a myth. This is not a, 
a made up story. Uh, this is not a fable like other Jewish myths and fables that were kind of, uh, you know, uh, being uh, propagated by uh, false teachers, uh, so called uh, Jewish uh, converts who come to the faith in Christ Jesus and uh, are part of the church. They were bringing in a lot of Jewish mythologies in the form of genealogies, genealogies Jewish fables that are not in the Bible. And uh, people were confused whether to believe that or not. And so here Paul is basically laying the foundations of our faith. And he's also saying that, you know, this is not a story that is uh, being circulated like, you know, the other stories, other myths and fables, uh, Jewish fables and mythologies. But this is the truth because um, he's seen by Peter and Apostle Peter uh, was uh, well known to the church. Uh, one of the greatest apostles, and then he was seen by the 12, seen more than uh, by 500 uh, brethren at once. Um, and also he talks about James, the apostle. Um, and he says, many of them have died, but many are present. So you can still ask them, can uh, get their testimonies and they are bear witness to this fact. Uh, and Paul says, last of all, you know, I myself have, see, uh, have uh, seen Christ. I have encountered Christ. I have uh, seen him. And that this was, uh, he's referring to his uh, uh, salvation experience or his encounter that he had with Jesus Christ on the road to um, Damascus. Um, and so here are uh, proofs that, you know, um, uh, that Jesus showed himself alive. Uh, and we, if you read scriptures uh, after his resurrection in Matthew and Mark, uh, we also see uh, various instances and in how uh, in John as well that, you know, Jesus appeared uh, to his disciples and to many more. And, uh, you know, he proved that uh, he's um, risen from the dead and he's not just a ghost. Okay, what happened to Christ after he, uh, you know, ascended back to the Father? Uh, he's now seated on the right hand of the throne of God. So he's seated on the highest throne. Um, Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. And First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. So can uh, three of you uh, each read uh, these verses, please? Mark 16, 19 to 20. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. And First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Mark 16, 19. Uh, go ahead, Joy. Okay. Thank you. Mark 16, 19 to 20. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Thank you. Joy. So here we see that, uh, you know, Christ ascended back to the Father, was received up in heaven because of uh, uh, he had completed the work, he had done the will of the Father, he was obedient, and the work was uh, completed, the penalty for sin was paid once for all, and now he sits and he sat down at the right hand of God the uh, Father, and then we see that uh, his disciples you know, continuing the work of uh, Jesus here on earth by preaching uh, the word and also their preaching was accompanied by mighty signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 was 9 to 11. Philippians chapter 2 was 9 to 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we uh, looked at Philippians chapter 2 earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, the incarnation of Christ. We looked at uh, verses 7 to 11 in detail. Uh, but here we see that, uh, you know, uh, once Christ finished his work on the cross, God has exalted him, uh, highly exalted him and given the name, given him Jesus a name that is above every um, name. 
that, uh, you know, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ uh, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So not only was he, uh, you know, uh, given back his position, but also his name is, uh, you know, considered to be the greatest name, uh, name above every name, and all those who bow their knee to that name in heaven on earth uh, and confess that Jesus Christ uh, is Lord, the glory of God the Father. So when we confess, we bow down, uh, we worship this name, we worship uh, this, uh, worship Jesus, we give him the glory and honor, uh, we give him the praise and the adoration, uh, uh, you know, we bring glory to God the Father. God the Father is glorified. Okay, so Jesus Christ is not only highly exalted, but his name is also given the highest uh, uh, status, the highest honor, the highest privilege, the highest power above every name under heaven and earth. First Peter chapter 3 verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Thank you. So Christ is not only, uh, you know, uh, given the highest uh, position, highly exalted. Uh, he's not only seated at the right hand of God. His uh, name is not only the highest exalted name in heaven and earth, but, uh, you know, all the angels and all the authorities and, and powers in heaven and earth has been made subject to him. Okay. Uh, so we see that after his death, his resurrection, uh, when he ascended back to the Father, uh, Jesus, uh, who was God, who is God, is given back his position, his authority that he had uh, before his incarnation, uh, even before time began. Uh, he was glorified with the glory that he had with the Father in eternity, eternity past. And that is what we read in uh, John chapter 17. I have uh, explained to you about John chapter 17, which is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And uh, Jesus uh, says, Father, I finished, I completed the work. Now give me back the glory that I had before you, uh, before time began. Um, so we see that, um, uh, you know, when he went back to the Father, he received back the glory of, uh, uh, of God. Um, he, uh, but when he came down to the earth, we know that he took on the sonship glory. And um, that's what he tells his father, that he wants us, those who believe in him, uh, you know, to receive that sonship glory. But he says, give me back the glory that I had even before the creation of the world. So even before uh, time began, eternity passed, the glory that he had, uh, Jesus was given back that glory. He was glorified with that glory. Um, and he was and is and will always be uh, the eternal word okay uh, we look at uh, the preaching of his resurrection after we come from the break if you look at your notes uh, this is only uh, half a page um, you know uh, the notes are only half page just a list of uh, uh, of uh, references but after we come back i will just uh, talk a little more about the nature of christ's resurrection and what we have received as a result of uh, uh, Christ's resurrection, or we'll talk about the doctrine of uh, resurrection, which is not in your notes. So maybe you can come prepared with uh, a notepad and a pen that you would like to take down notes. Okay, I'll see you after the break. Thank you, everyone. Mom? Yes, 